All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to our annual Fall Implementation Science Seminar Series. It's wonderful to see everybody here. Uh, our Implementation Science Core in the Department of Psychiatry and Human Behavior at Brown University has recently rebranded as the Brown Research on Implementation and Dissemination to Guide Evidence Use Program, or BRIDGE Program. This is the sixth year of our Implementation Science Programming, and we are thrilled to be able to bring these seminars to our Providence and Rhode Island community of implementation scientists, as well as uh, to those of you who are joining us from other states. <clears throat> we are very grateful for our partnerships that make these webinars work. Uh, the Advanced Rhode Island Clinical and Translational Research or Advanced CTR supports the technology, logistics, and marketing of these seminars. We also recognize our partnership with the Brown Alcohol Research Center on HIV or Brown Arch for their support of these seminars. My name is Ruben Martinez. I'm an assistant professor here in the Bridge Program. I'm introducing our speaker today, and I will also be helping to moderate the Q&A at the end. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Laura Bayless. Dr. Bayless is a research scientist at the Gretchen, Gretchen Swanson Center for Nutrition. She earned her PhD at Virginia Tech in human nutrition, foods, and exercise with an emphasis on behavioral and implementation science. Her work focuses on implementation strategies to support the uptake of physical activity environment and policy interventions in community settings. She combines her scientific training with years of real world public health experience. Her research philosophy is grounded in participatory methods and her investigations seek solutions to simultaneously solve real world problems and advance implementation science. Today, we're really excited that Dr. Bayless is presenting on implementation strategies adapted for communities uh, specifically around integrating physical activity interventions in real world settings. I do wanna remind folks before I turn it over, if you have questions, please use the uh, Q&A function. We'll be monitoring the Q&A function and we'll have around 15 minutes at the end for questions for Dr. Bayless. Uh, now I'll turn it over to Dr. Bayless. We're very excited to learn from you today. Great, thank you so much for the nice introduction. So I'll start by telling you just a little bit more about my background and a little bit more about the Gretchen Swanson Center for Nutrition as well. So my background is in public health and physical activity promotion. And I use the squiggly line to show that I didn't go straight from one degree program to the next. But um, as was mentioned, I have several years of work experience in public health, and that's really informed my approach to research. So I worked at a early Head Start program managing health and nutrition services. I worked with the CATCH or Coordinated Approach to Child Health program in school and after school settings. I got my PhD at Virginia Tech with a focus on implementation science. And during most of that time, I was also working as an extension educator in Wyoming on nutrition, food safety, and physical activity programs moved up to a state level role in extension in Arkansas. So I was an assistant professor and extension specialist overseeing health promotion programs in the state and then eventually made my way to GSCN. So the center is a national nonprofit research institute. We do a mix of um, research grants and contracts we provide measurement and evaluation expertise to our partners across the country, some outside the country, uh, with a goal of helping enhance their healthy eating and active living interventions. And we invite you to connect with us on social media. Okay, so today I will talk about the research to practice gap, why it's especially challenging in community settings and some implications for health equity, then move on to talking about the recent study I'm sharing on our new compilation of implementation strategies and um, give some examples related to my work throughout. Getting evidence-based interventions into practice settings is challenging. Only 14% of original research ends up being delivered in the real world, and this takes an average 17 years. So we know that evidence-based interventions are not reaching community members. And I'm guessing most of you in the audience know this already. Um, so what I wanna focus on today is why this is especially challenging in community settings and how it's a challenge for achieving health equity. So to start, I'll try to give you a few moments 
to um, pause and read these quotes. So these are all some examples of the challenges of moving research to practice. These are all real world examples that I've experienced or that my colleagues or community partners delivering programs in community settings have experienced. And they all affect an intervention's overall impact on public health. So our examples are, it can be difficult to reach the priority population to ensure that staff and settings adopt programs, that they're delivered with fidelity to the core components and that they're maintained long-term long in systems. So as you may have guessed, I'm using the REAIM framework or reach effectiveness adoption implementation and maintenance to highlight these research to practice challenges because REAIM was designed to assess overall health impact, meaning the combination of these dimensions. Or in other words, as Russ Glasgow has shared, REAIM tells us where to look and where things often break down. So as an example, even if we have a perfect intervention that's 100% effective, but it's only adopted by 50% of eligible delivery agents, only delivered with 50% fidelity to the core components, only reaches 50% of the priority population, and is only maintained in 50% of settings, we end up with this voltage drop where we went from 100% effectiveness to only 6% overall impact in practice. So I'll, I'll give you some examples from my work of how I used REAIM to evaluate interventions, to see where things broke down and how this influenced the overall public health impact and also informed the need for implementation strategies. So I'll tell you a little bit more about the setting for the studies I'll share today. Um, if you're not familiar, the Cooperative Extension System is associated with land-grant universities in each state and territory in the U.S. So land-grant universities have a three-pronged mission in addition to doing teaching and research. They also have to extend or do extension work to um, share resources with uh, community members throughout their state or area. So if you're familiar with 4-H, that's the most um, visible <laughs> and largest in terms of numbers extension program. So that's the youth development arm. There's also agriculture, which is the historical focus of extension, health and wellness, and community development. There's typically um, specialists who are housed in universities who oversee programs statewide. And then there's agents or educators who are usually in county offices who are doing the um, boots on the ground work. So the first study I did as part of my dissertation work was a systematic review of older adult physical activity programs where we compared what was done in the peer-reviewed literature to the gray or unpublished literature to find um, unpublished results of extension programs. We wanted to see how they compared. And one of the findings was that there were 17 unique older adult physical activity programs delivered in extension in the states that are um, shaded red. And a lot of them were not evidence-based. So it became clear that there was this challenge with program duplication and that new programs were being created instead of um, adopting what works. So after that, I became interested in how we could better scale out programs from one state to another or one county to another to do what works and avoid this program duplication. So for example, taking a program that had been developed in Virginia and testing it in Wyoming where I was working. The next study also related to older adult physical activity programs was really three studies in one. We used REAIM to explore practice-based perceptions before program adoption. Then we looked at decision-making around the program training. And then finally, during implementation of the program, we looked at the overall impact through REAIM, and then we looked at contextual considerations in each of these phases. So REAIM was used through an iterative process both to structure the three stages, so pre-adoption, adoption, implementation, and then within each stage to interpret the results and inform the next steps. So just um, one of the findings from 
these three studies from the last study, looking at the overall impact, uh, found that the program, which was called Lift Lifelong Improvements Through Fitness Together, um, had the potential to reach a large and representative portion of the population, especially in rural areas. So for example, there was one small rural community where the program was delivered, where we reached 30% of eligible older adults. But adoption rates among the extension agents and community partners who could deliver the program were low and collecting data on effectiveness, implementation, and maintenance was a challenge as that empirical um, data collection is fairly new in extension. So overall, the impact was lower than it could have been. After this, I shifted my research a bit and was able to focus more on my interest in those policy or environment level interventions and how to improve their uptake and extension, which has historically focused more on individual level education. The next study, also in extension, was looking at scaling out point of decision prompts, which are an evidence-based intervention recommended by the community guide. Really simple, just posters that are placed right where you're deciding if you are going to take the stairs or the elevator with, of course, the prompt to take the stairs. So I knew that in extension that the evaluation for this would need to be pragmatic and feasible and fit with typical practice. So I worked with colleagues to develop the protocols for the study, and we used a data collection approach called brief opportunistic interviews. So this was done as an alternative to how these are usually evaluated, which would be several hours or several days of pre and post observations at each site. So the interviews were just one hour at each poster site where the uh, researcher or staff would just ask a few brief questions to anyone who walked by and agreed. So did you see the poster? Do you feel like it changed your behavior? If so, how? And then just checking back in six months later for maintenance data. So with this study, overall, the posters were widely adopted by the extension agents. Most of the posters were implemented as intended, meaning they were in the right place, which is sometimes a challenge depending on um, the facility you're placing the poster at. And the challenges here were capturing reach, effectiveness, and maintenance data. So my colleagues found the evaluation burdensome and said that they didn't feel like it was worth their time. They didn't enjoy doing these interviews. Um, so it was difficult to determine the full impact and if the posters were actually effective at increasing physical activity levels. So one more program that I brought to extension in Wyoming was the 4th H for Health Challenge. It also is evidence-based. It was developed and tested in extension in three New England states through a participatory approach. Also pretty simple, it's uh, basically healthy meeting guidelines where 4-H clubs or programs are asked to track three healthy habits. So are they serving a fruit or vegetable as a snack? Are they serving water at their meetings or events? And are they including 15 minutes of physical activity? And the reason I um, was interested in bringing this challenge to the state was through my work, I was doing a lot of you know teaching youth nutrition programs and like after school settings. I also did a bit of work just helping with 4-H events that my colleagues were doing in the county and noticed that we were giving out um, two liters of Pepsi as a prize at one of the events and just saw a real disconnect between what I was um, teaching youth and then what they were getting through 4-H. So next step, was I did a needs assessment across the state to see if what I had observed was accurate. Um, found that most 4-H clubs or programs were actually serving water. There wasn't a valid question about um, giving out soda or pop. Maybe should have added that. But um, most of the clubs were not serving fruits or vegetables and were not including physical activities. So decided there was a need for this intervention partnered with 4-H colleagues, used tested strategies like having program champions or early adopters, offering training and technical assistance and kickoff events, and found that only um, 17 
of about 1,700 staff and volunteers, which is mostly volunteers, um, adopted the challenge. So adoption was almost zero. So our overall impact was almost zero. And the number is a little bit challenging um, to determine the denominator on that one. Some volunteers aren't necessarily in a position where they would um, bring the snacks or lead activities, but either way, adoption rates were very low. And what we detailed in this paper, which was one of those, this didn't work, but here's what we can learn manuscripts was the difference between uh, funded researcher initiated kind of top down approach in the other states versus more of the bottom up um, agent initiated approach where there wasn't like a formal agreement for anyone to participate in the study. And I think it's interesting because at this time, we looked and found 16 state extension systems that said on their websites that they used this um, intervention, but there was no data collection. So curious what you know the adoption rates and overall impacts are across other states. So let's go back to the voltage drop concept. We have some examples. Um, on the health equity side, we know that these challenges can be exacerbated when delivering interventions in settings with lower resources, which are often those um, reaching populations who face health disparities. So for example, adoption can be challenging, programs can be viewed as burdensome, there are competing demands in community settings where people have many different roles. Sometimes the interventions are viewed as a poor fit, especially if they weren't developed in partnership. There's often not high quality support um, for a continued period of time to help with program delivery. There can be barriers to reaching um, the priority population if it's hard for them to participate or if it wasn't promoted in diverse ways. And then maintenance can be challenging due to less resources and less capacity to continue programs. So if we started with two settings, one had lower resources, one had higher resources, but we failed to improve health in the setting with the lower resources, and we did improve outcomes in the setting with higher resources, we end up with um, oops, what we call intervention generated inequalities. So where we've actually created a wider gap in the inequities. So all that taken together to improve overall public health impact in community settings and to avoid exacerbating health disparities, we need to work to improve intervention reach, adoption, implementation, maintenance, especially in these settings with lower resources. And we can do that through implementation strategies. So we've, we've got the tools, we have our uh, methods or techniques to move research to practice. And even though this is an implementation science seminar, just to get everyone on the same page as we all might come from different backgrounds. Um, so for the terminology, when I'm talking about implementation strategies, sharing some non-scientific language that comes from Jeff Curran that can be helpful. So the evidence-based policy, practice, program, procedure is the thing that we want to be implemented in our real world setting. And the implementation strategies are the stuff we do to try to help people or places do the thing. One more visual example that shows the multiple levels of interventions. So the support system, which could be technical assistance providers, grant makers, researchers, program coordinators, um, extension specialists, in my examples, can deliver the stuff or the implementation strategies to the delivery system. So this is typically intervening at the staff or setting level, and then the delivery personnel in these systems. So for example, the extension agents implement the thing or the evidence-based intervention to the priority population. So the community members, 4-Hers, older adults, et cetera. So we have a great foundation in implementation strategies. There's multiple compilations to choose from, such as the widely used ERIC or expert recommendations for implementing change taxonomy. One challenge though, is that because this compilation and others originated in clinical healthcare settings, they haven't been as easily applied to community settings. And I wanna define uh, how I'm using community settings 
So my definition is that they are organizations that deliver public health interventions, but have missions beyond healthcare. I'm using a model developed by Stephanie Mazuka and colleagues that includes six community settings that do deliver public health interventions. And then I've added a seventh, so non-clinical public health settings to capture organizations like Extension that also deliver these interventions. And then one other distinction related to community settings is where they deliver programs. So they deliver programs in natural environments where people live, learn, work, and play. Interventions are typically at the primary prevention level as opposed to like screening or early detection. So we're trying to typically change behavior or what we like to call patterns and practices such as dietary quality, physical activity levels, or tobacco use. And these interventions are at multiple levels, but increasingly are changing policies, systems, environments. So a focus on these complex interventions that change social determinants of health. So because of this variation in the organizations that deliver the interventions and the settings they're delivered in, it's arguably more difficult to integrate evidence-based interventions in community settings and clinical settings um, might be a fun debate topic at a conference. Uh, but to make my case for this, I'll draw your attention to the inner setting of the consolidated framework for implementation research. So while we know that there's determinants at many levels that affect program integration, the inner setting is especially different between clinical and community because of that definition of community settings, where by definition, they're mission, their vision, their culture is not focused on public health, might be focused on youth development or education or profits, if it's a food retail setting, for example, and they often don't have funding streams to support public health interventions. Practitioners and researchers in community settings do use implementation strategies and have a long history of doing so, but they're not often referred to that way by name, and the scope is more limited. So in community settings, tried and true um, strategies like training and hoping are used more often. Other individual level strategies like educational meetings and materials and outreach visits are more typical instead of using the full spectrum of available implementation strategies and choosing those as appropriate that address organizational or outer setting barriers rather than just focusing on individuals. And then when introduced to existing strategy compilations, the response typically is, is this something I can use or that doesn't apply to me because those in community settings haven't heard about this yet since it's focused on clinical and then again, the clinical language <clears throat> is challenging. <clears throat> so in response to this, first, my colleagues and I published a commentary just to introduce community settings to the ERIC taxonomy and say, yes, you can and should and likely already are using implementation strategies. And we simply changed language and provided community setting examples of the ERIC implementation strategies. So just things like changing patients to participants or priority population, changing clinical innovation to evidence-based program. So that was the first step, but we were still left with questions of which of these strategies are actually used in community settings, which are effective. Are there other strategies that are not on this list uh, that we don't know about? So all that finally leads to the current study and of course, want to acknowledge my wonderful colleagues who helped with all the um, qualitative work and uh, funding. So this was funded through a public goods award through the National Cancer Institute's Consortium for Cancer Implementation Science. Our goal was to develop a new compilation of implementation strategies with input from community setting researchers and practitioners. And we did this through an EMIC approach. So instead of beginning with an existing compilation and asking which strategies were used and adapting them, we wanted to hear from them in their own words what challenges come up in practice and how they overcome them, what strategies they use. 
We did semi-structured interviews over Zoom and record, recruited both the researchers and the practitioners through uh, purposive and snowball sampling. The eligibility criteria for practitioners, they had to manage or coordinate evidence-based interventions delivered by staff or volunteers so that they could speak about strategies they use to assist others implementing programs. And then researchers, they had to be conducting community engaged research with the goal of improving adoption, implementation, or maintenance of the evidence-based program. And as for the programs, they had to have primary cancer prevention outcomes. So physical activity, nutrition, and or um, tobacco use. Our interview guide was based on re-aim just as a simple way to guide the interviewees through the challenges that occur in research and practice throughout the process. So the phases of getting interventions adopted, implemented, maintained. So we went through each re-aim dimension, asked these challenges, asked these questions to get at what challenges occurred. And then for each challenge we were told about, asked what strategies were used to overcome them. And um, this elicited really rich information about implementation strategies, even if they weren't referred to by name, and even if it was someone without an implementation science background. We used a rapid deductive approach to the analysis. We developed a coding guide in alignment with our interview guide. So that included the re -aim dimension, the barrier addressed, a description of the implementation strategies, and then a brief implementation strategy code or name. The interviewers served as primary coders and took notes during or shortly after the interviews. And then a second coder listened to the interviews and added to or edited the first coders notes. We did some sorting and collapsing to combine strategies that were worded similarly. So provide training to program implementers or train program implementers. And once we had done that, we were able to um, calculate saturation throughout the process. We used a method adapted from Guest et al, where we had an original set of data, which was six interviews, which had a mix of researchers and practitioners. And then we checked each run, which was three interviews, and compared that to the first set to see how much new information was generated with a goal of getting below 5% um, new information or new strategies through each set of interviews. So we did 18 interviews. We reached saturation at interview number 15 and then just finished our scheduled interviews at that point. This included eight practitioners and 10 researchers, although we found that the interviewees often wore multiple hats, so they may have um, met eligibility criteria, criteria as a researcher, but during the interview, they told us that they also have a practitioner role, maybe overseeing a statewide public health program. The programs that they oversaw or delivered or researched were at typically both levels, interpersonal and individual, or the policy system environment level, and their outcomes typically um, were multiple. And then as for the settings, we're reporting this by the number of programs they told us about, which was 35. So most were in um, a non-clinical public health setting or education, although they may have reported education based on their employer versus um, also where they were delivering the program. And we did capture all seven of those settings um, in the model. So I have some close to final results to share today. We're just wrapping up our analysis. So we have um, about 50 strategies in our new compilation, which is called Isaac Implementation Strategies Adapted for Communities. And this is just a snapshot of some of the most commonly mentioned strategies with their definition and an example. And there's some interesting results. So there's some strategies that are not included in other compilations. So for example, we heard about this creative leveraging of funding sources. So for example, there was a program that was intergenerational where originally the goal was to focus more on the older adults and get funding for older adult outcomes, but that was difficult and they ended up getting funding for the youth component of the program. 
There are also, um, unsurprisingly, a few strategies related to partnerships, so engaging community members, working with community partners, meeting their needs. As for the reaim dimensions, most of the strategies we heard about were used to address multiple barriers that fit with multiple reaim dimensions, most commonly uh, related to adoption, implementation, and reach. And I will note that usually when we look at outcomes of implementation strategies, we're focusing on that organizational level. So we're looking at adoption, implementation, maintenance, of course, other outcomes like acceptability, appropriateness, feasibility. Um, so we also decided to include um, reach and effectiveness, which are not as typically included as uh, outcomes of implementation strategies but are including it here because of um, the work done over the years with community settings and from this study where we know that there are challenges with effectiveness, so with continuing to assess um, programs in real world settings, especially if they continue long term and the researcher support is pulled away, and also challenges with reach. And we know that there are implementation or dissemination strategies that can be used to help practitioners better reach the priority population. So what's next for Isaac? The goal is to broadly disseminate it. So research researchers and practitioners will have a wider range of relevant strategies available to them and can select strategies that address barriers in their unique settings. And we hope that others will use the compilation, label the strategies, by name so we can build the evidence base and I can come back in five or 10 years and report on which strategies are the most effective for addressing specific barriers and which work for whom under what conditions. And while we don't have the data yet to develop a full matching tool where you could select strategies to resolve specific barriers, we are working on two guidance tools that may help. And the goal of the funding for this work is to develop publicly available goods. So um, these will be available shortly through the Consortium for Cancer Implementation Science and on our Gretchen Swanson Center for Nutrition website. So this first one uses data collected during the interviews on which reaim dimension was addressed through each strategy. And it can be used to Think about a challenge happening in research or practice, so maybe a challenge with maintaining fidelity to the intervention or reaching the priority population, and then just have several implementation strategies to consider that we know others have also used to address that challenge. A second one, so we decided to do this based on some feedback from the Consortium for Cancer Implementation Science Action Group that I'm a part of we asked what frameworks were the most commonly used and REAIM and CIFR rose to the top um, among both researchers and practitioners. So this tool is based on the domains of CIFR. So it's pretty broad, but it's also meant to be framework agnostic. So we've made it so it can also fit with other frameworks that um, researchers may use. So EPIS, PRISM, IPARIS, their domains are all fairly similar. So you could use this to look at, again, a challenge you wanted to overcome, like barriers within the organization, the inner setting, um, or the outer setting, and again, just have some options to choose from. And then I'll also note, just even looking at this partial list of strategies, that we did identify many that are used to intervene at those levels versus just the individual level that's more commonly addressed. So finally, I have um, a couple of studies to talk about as I wrap this up, where I solved or started to solve some of these real world challenges and work through the process of assessing contextual factors, selecting and testing relevant implementation strategies. So first, as part of my role in Arkansas, I was PI of the CDC funded high obesity program grant or cooperative agreement. And this was focused on policy and environment level nutrition and physical activity strategies. 
We had funding for five counties. They had to have an adult obesity rate of 40% or higher to qualify to get the funding. So as for the interventions, uh, there were several options to choose from. On the nutrition side, we did a lot of work primarily with food pantries where we would work with them to get them to adopt healthy purchasing policies. And once they had those policies in place, we could provide support, did some work during COVID to help them get more shelves, more refrigeration to meet the bigger demand. On the physical ac activity side, uh, focus on evidence-based approaches recommended by the CDC and the community guide. So primarily working on connecting everyday routes and increasing access to places for physical activity. So we would try to improve the environment or infrastructure between two places we'd identified, like a store and a school or a childcare, for example. And then we could also do improvements to sites like those um, parks or playgrounds. So here's an example. Um, in one area, we partnered with community leaders to do a traffic calming intervention and we tested it through what we call a pop-up or a demonstration event. So a temporary event um, over just a few hours to put some of these changes in place and get feedback and buy-in. So what we did was we took two two-way streets between a park and a school, so on either side of the park, and turned them both just for that afternoon into one-way streets. We added crosswalks, and a walking or biking lane, which there's actually two kids in this picture. So we were we were thrilled to get a picture of kids, um, you know, walking in the walking lane and also use temporary speed bumps to slow traffic to let them know those crosswalks were coming. We ended up um, getting the mayor on board and community decided to start with some smaller scale changes. So they ended up putting in um, those temporary speed bumps and a temporary or movable flashing speed limit sign in the area. So because of extensions, historical focus on individual level interventions and the need to do more policy and system level work, um, I was interested in scaling out this work to other counties that didn't have the CDC funding and, and resources. So when I talked to agents in all the other counties of the state, they were interested but hesitant and just didn't know a lot about this type of work or where they would really start. So of course, um, as an implementation scientist, I saw this as an opportunity to figure out what implementation strategies were necessary to scale out this work to other counties. So we already had a um, toolkit in the works for the agents in the funded counties. The toolkit was designed to give some visuals of each of the built environment approaches and some examples, some examples of pop-up events as well, and just show the overall public health process to walk through what this would look like from starting with working with a coalition to selecting and implementing and evaluating interventions. So we wanted to determine how to make the toolkit the most useful to all the agents across the state and figure out what other implementation strategies were needed. We did a qualitative study with agents. Um, it was virtual. I can probably take that out now. This was when that was uh, <laughs> a little bit novel um, in 2020 when we started doing everything virtually. So the interview guide for this study was based on the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research we focused on the characteristics of intervention and individuals. We also integrated some questions from the technology acceptance model related to usefulness and ease of using the toolkit. The results showed that agents did have positive perceptions about interventions to change the physical activity environment. They had positive perceptions of the toolkit, but there was a lot of other support they felt like they needed. So the most prevalent categories under our theme of um, the support that was needed were related to coalitions. So they had coalitions in various phases, but expressed a lot of challenges and uh, funding was a challenge too. So next up of course was to 
select implementation strategies to overcome these barriers using the implementation research logic model to highlight the process. And there's many options for this step. Um, there's concept mapping, group model building, conjoint analysis, intervention mapping, but sometimes these aren't as feasible in community settings because of the time or resources or specialized software involved. So we did what fit with our resources, which was a more uh, rapid approach where the agents had told us what they needed. And then we worked within an integrated research practice partnership. So some of my staff at the state level who had previously served as agents gave input. We selected strategies and then got feedback from agents on those strategies. What we ended up with our package or bundle of implementation strategies. We selected those that we considered feasible within the organization and within the early stage of this work. So to address the coalition barrier, we developed an intervention called coalition coaching, where we would help agents work through the five stages of coalition building based on the coalition works framework, where they move from pre-formation to institutionalization. To address the funding barrier, we offered mini grants that could be used for those micro level or smaller scale built environment changes, even things like putting in benches along a walking path or better lighting or beautification projects downtown that can be shown to um, increase physical activity. The grants could also be used to fund pop-up events so they could test the events, get feedback, get buy-in and apply for more funding. And then we refined the toolkit based on the feedback we got the agents wanted more examples of working with all their various community partners and more guidance and tools on needs assessments. So some of these are still underway um, in Arkansas. The, the toolkit is still available and it's been shared with some other states. Um, but at that point, I changed jobs, moved back out west, was able to uh, reestablish partnerships with extension colleagues I had worked with in the past in Montana and Wyoming. And I was interested in doing some similar work there. Um, I knew there was a need for it. When I worked in Wyoming, I did a lot of my work on the Wind River Indian Reservation. The adult obesity rate there is 70%, but they were not eligible for the CDC high obesity program funds because the um, data was reported at the county level. So when it was combined with the county, it was below 40%. So based on my experience, um, there was a similar need to expand the use of built environment changes and to figure out implementation strategies to scale them, especially without the support like the CDC funding. Um, colleagues were on board, said that you know they wanted to do something like this, but didn't know where to start. So that sounded like a good partnership, you know, meeting their needs and also advancing the science. Um, I also didn't want to repeat the exact same study that I had just done, so tried a more rapid approach to the contextual inquiry step. We did a short survey for extension agents and educators in those two states based on our previous research, research and experience, knew that it had to be pretty brief, so kept it to about 10 minutes or less, and just asked about first barriers and facilitators to doing built environment approaches, um, asked about interest in specific implementation strategies based on strategies we thought they might need. And then finally, interest or preferences for specific built environment interventions, again, at the micro level that they could start with. So this skips ahead a little bit, right? We've not yet identified the barriers and facilitators. We haven't yet matched them to strategies, but we're already asking for input on the strategies. So to predict the potential strategies, we used the classifications by um, Lehman and colleagues. We selected capacity building strategies and implementation process strategies. We use both of these because they are meant to target general capacity rather than one specific evidence-based intervention that fit with our approach and working on built environment strategies, which are evidence-based, but really are a menu of options because they look so different in every community. 
With the need for that flexibility in mind, we also wanted to see which approaches agents were most interested in so we could eventually tailor the strategies to um, what they would be most likely to work on in their communities. So results of this ranked order question show they're interested in both those activity-friendly routes and in access to places. So both things like crosswalks and painted intersections and also improving playgrounds, um, developing shared use agreements. And then the, the last step was um, matching to strategies and triangulating with what they told us they were interested in. So their barriers, they told us that the priority was still often on individual level interventions. They felt like they didn't have the resources, especially time and personnel to start doing more built environment work. They perceive that there'd be a high cost to doing that work. And then as for facilitators, the external policy and incentives construct within CFER in this case really referred to community coalitions. So interesting that it's different by state, but here they perceived that they did have work with community coalitions already and that that was um, a strength. There was also a positive implementation climate. So in general, the like administrators and the extension system was supportive of agents and their work. So next using the CFER ERIC match tool where we can get recommended strategies for each barrier. Um, these are the highest recommended composite strategies, meaning they could address collectively these top barriers. And then looking at the ranked order question of agents desired implementation strategies. They were not interested in mini grants, which was also interesting and different between states. They were interested in doing needs assessments, which matches up with a couple of the recommend recommended strategies. And they were interested in facilitation. So we decided we could use a facilitated approach and offer the bundle of implementation strategies under that through a interactive support process. As for what we would include, we took out the build a coalition strategy since that was a facilitator, not a barrier, added in a strategy because even though they weren't interested in um, mini grants, we knew that there was still somehow a need to access funding for these interventions. So we could instead support them in applying for larger local, state, federal grants. And then going back finally to um, their barriers and facilitators to make sure that the strategies address them and just operationalize how they would work. So what we figured was that we could address relative priority through engaging community partners and members in prioritizing built environment approaches to increase the demand. So including through consensus discussions in communities and presenting needs assessment data to overcome the resource barrier, we could share those resources that are already present in community coalitions to get the work done and then addressing costs through um, accessing new funding. So that was the, the pilot study that I detailed here. The next steps, which hopefully I'll get an official funding announcement very soon for my R21 proposal, um, are to do the, the process following the implementation research logic model, where first we would select and tailor these implementation strategies through an integrated research practice partnership with the agent. So see if all this that we came up with works for them, tailor the strategies to best meet their needs. And then in the next aim, we would actually pilot test them in Montana and see the outcomes in terms of our agents adopting more built environment approaches, or at least initiating those approaches, and then hopefully testing in um, more, uh, more states, especially in the Western region in the future. Okay, happy to take some questions now. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Bayless, for that. Uh, some really interesting work, and I have some questions of my own, but um, I do want to start with the, the questions that have been asked by the audience. Um, so I want to start, this is going way back to the STEP study. Um, we had a question about 
whether you had tried to control for social desirability in that study at all. Um, okay, I think the, the question is referring to like when we did the opportunistic interviews and asked if what response people gave us. Um, we did not, I think, thinking back to the, the few people, the few interviews we did because overall uh, my colleagues did not want to do <laughs> those interviews. I, I think we got mixed results and it seemed like people were, were being fairly honest. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so one question that I had was, it seems like in your work, your work intersects with uh, both policy and local government a decent amount. Um, and I'm just curious how you approach policy as a lever for your work uh, or a mechanism or um, just how you approach forming those relationships. Yeah, I think um, it takes time and it takes, you know, relationship building and for example, the work we did um, in Arkansas, we had staff in those five counties or close to those five counties who could get to know those elected officials and we'd go and do uh, a presentation to them about our funding and what type of work we could do and see what they were interested in. Um, and one thing that was interesting was we would talk about, of course, both the nutrition and the physical activity side. And it seemed like the nutrition side clicked like they got it oh yeah we, we got to help people eat healthier the physical activity side not so much they'd say like oh yeah I guess those like spandex biker people would like this so <laughs> that was tough for me as like oh no they're not they're not getting it um so trying to like refine that approach to explain better um that it's everyday routes for everyone but also thinking about what do the policymakers care about and when we talked about potential economic benefits of like improving a downtown and making it more walkable, um, that was speaking their language. So mm -hmm. that's another lesson I took from that was to include um, always the, the economic approach or whatever you think would really resonate with them. That's wonderful. Thank you for that, for that answer. I love that. Um, and to that point, um, you had mentioned so it sounded like there was a lot of resistance throughout some of these studies around the implementation planning process and some, um, you know, you're working in community settings where people don't have a lot of time and they have a lot of things on their plate. I'm just wondering if you can speak to that and um, for, for folks who are just getting into implementation work, especially in community mental health centers or community settings, it's a really common thing that, uh, that pops up and just how you address that and ways to go about um, approaching that. Yeah, I think it's so hard because ideally you have to have something that um, your community partners really want. Like that's, I think one of the, you know, the 10 key ingredients to writing a, a DNI proposal is to show that like, yeah, they actually want this work. And sometimes that's not the case where, you know, I really want to do this, this healthy meeting for each intervention um, and maybe they're not as interested. So I think continuing to figure out like how you can tailor and adapt and, and better meet their needs. That was another one of my takeaways from that study is like, oh, we, we didn't do an adaptation process and maybe this um, healthy meeting intervention should look totally different in Wyoming than in these other states, mm -hmm. even though it was developed you know, in partnership with extension, like all the right things, um, just the states are different. And maybe that would have helped create an intervention or adapted intervention that was more of interest. Yeah, speaks to the importance of context. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. And I was also curious about, there was something I, I was excited about was that you mentioned these guidance tools around matching strategies to barriers and coming up with, it sounds like some sort of toolkit around that. I'd love to hear more about what your vision for that is and how you're actually going about doing that, creating that. Sure. So we were hoping to come up with something that was like an alternative that was more specific to community settings that was comparable to like the Cifer Eric match tool, where that's one of the options right now that's pretty, you know, it's open access, it's free, you can download it, plug in your barriers, get your strategies. Um, but when my colleagues and I have used it, again, it was challenging to translate to community settings. Um, but what we ended up discussing in our team is that we we don't actually know yet like we don't have the data to know which strategies are most effective so that's where we came up with like okay here's here's a light version 
we don't know exactly yet, but this just is sharing based on um, the results of our study, what others are using that, that helps them. So yeah, it'll be available just basically what I shared, but we'll have like a, a, a light, a, a brief version, like maybe our top 10 list um, that we'll share on, on social media and other places. And then on the website also like a full version that can be downloaded. So meant to be, you know, you're a practitioner and you just want a quick, like, what are my top 10 strategies that I should look at? Or you want to really dig into all 50. So it'll be the, the list, um, the tool with Reaim, and then the tool that can be used with CIFR or other determinant frameworks. Very cool. And uh, we do have another question here from the chat. Uh, have you been able to leverage what has worked in one state to argue for implementing a strategy in another state? Yeah, I think we can learn a lot like between states in extension where um, there are some barriers that come up that are common. And then, as I mentioned, there's some that are different, like is community coalitions a, a barrier or is it a facilitator? So um, what I want to do as we expand this work and test strategies in other states is a really like rapid process to quickly figure out what are the common or um, unique barriers and then match them to the strategies we already have or others. So instead of going through this whole process where we do a study in each state, we can say like, okay, we know that barriers in Arkansas um, resulted in these strategies, which were effective and in Wyoming and Montana, these strategies, and then use those um, in other states that face the same barriers. Because while every state's different, there's also some regional differences where I can say like, okay, the Western states in extension, like typically have a similar structure, the, the Southeast states, you know, are a bit different, have their own structure. Great, thank you. Thank you. Well, um, unless anyone else has any other questions, um, I'm going, just a quick announcement. Thank you very much, Dr. Bayless. It was so interesting to hear about your work and I especially love the, uh, the graphics and the dissemination that you're doing. Um, you can definitely tell that you have a team working on that and there's just some really great stuff going on there. I love that kind of graphic dissemination. It's very cool. Um, so next week at 12 p.m., I will be giving uh, doing this seminar um, talking about applying novel methods for improving equity in the implementation process, specifically when implementing uh, measurement-based care and, and low-resource community mental health centers. Uh, we'd love to have you join and we really appreciate being here today with us, and we really appreciate um, uh, Advanced RI, um, Arch, and of course, Dr. Bayless. Thank you all.